Hi, good morning. It's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm just doing, I'm a math educator, and so I'm just doing kind of a broad um, description of numeracy, mostly from a math education perspective. And so I hope this is helpful to you as soon as I figure out how to advance this. That's not it. Um, whoops. <laughs> uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, historically, it, at least in the U.S., uh, numeracy has been subsumed, and this is the word that's been used a lot in the literacy um, world, under literacy. For example, they talk about the National Assessment of Adult Literacy, which includes numeracy. And, um, and I just pulled off the web. The West Virginia Department of Ed on their website says, a common definition of literacy used today is, quote, this is their quotes within their quote, um, the ability to read, write, and speak English and compute and solve problems at levels of proficiency. And so I'm very glad that you're addressing issues of numeracy separate from literacy, because I think the issues really are quite different. And further, numeracy is different from school math. Um, and uh, Robert Orle said, unlike math, numeracy does not so much lead upward in an ascending pursuit of abstraction as it moves outward toward an ever richer engagement with life's diverse contexts and situations. And that's really the difference. You know, in mathematics, you get more and more abstract, and one, um, math concept is supposed to lead to another, whereas thinking about numeracy, it's really applying whatever mathematical reasoning or knowledge or content that you have in more and more diverse situations for different purposes. Um, since numeracy is relatively new in this country, um, actually relatively new as a um, conceptualized anywhere. It's, it really started in England, and one of the earlier um, definitions is um, includes the at-homeness with numbers and an ability to make use of math skills which enable an individual to cope with practical mathematical designs and everyday life, demands rather. And the second is to have some appreciation and understanding of information and this is, I think, really where the medical field interacts with numeracy, um, which is presented in mathematical terms and graphs, charts, tables, references to percentage increase and decrease. I was this morning having a conversation with Pat, who said, I have run into people in public health who can't do that, don't understand the idea of percent increase. And this was not the patient's. Yeah. Um, from Australia, another definition is talking about a critical awareness that builds bridges between math and the real world and all its diversity. No particular level of mathematics is associated with it, um, as it's important for an engineer to be numerate, just as it is for a primary school child, a parent, a car driver, a gardener. It's the different contexts that are activated. And finally, an American, Lynn Steen, um, talks about five dimensions of numeracy. The practical, for civic purposes, professional, to provide skills necessary for employment, recreational, to understand games, sports, lotteries, as well as cultural, just being part of the community and, um, and understanding the cultural context. So what does it mean to activate numeracy? And so Diana Coben, who's also British, this is actually part of the problem, is in the United States, um, we talk about adult literacy. In other countries, they talk about literacy, numeracy, and language, and really raise the status of numeracy and the attention to it. You know, and this is probably part of our culture where it's okay to say, I can't do math, nobody in my family can do math, you know, um, that somehow it's genetic or, um, 
And, and we, it's okay for people to say, I can't do math. It's not so much okay for people to say, I can't read. But culturally, we're okay with people saying, you know, I can't, I can't do math. It's okay. I'll get someone else to do it for me. Um, and so, but the issue is comfortable with your judgment on whether to use math in a situation, what math to use, how to use it, and what degree of accuracy is appropriate. And that's the part, a part that's really important. Um, when you're out shopping it's, and you don't want to get to the cash register without enough money, you have to keep track of kind of what you're buying. It doesn't have to be exact. And in fact, it makes good sense to round up because, you know, there's tax or there's, you know, errors or something. But, you know, making those decisions about what makes sense in what situation is really key. Okay. So putting together the components of numeracy, it seems that it's really important to think about the context or the purpose that somebody is going to engage numeracy. So there's further learning, you know, that, but we won't particularly talk about that. You know, whether it's training, higher education, you know, to learn that you need math for those purposes. But more relevant to us is for the workplace, to be able to perform tasks, get a job, learn new things on your job. Um, community, family or personal, and then the content that goes into numeracy can include number operations, patterns, functions, algebra, measurement, a lot of measurement, um, understanding measurement, and in some areas shape, and then the idea of data statistics and probability that I know people will be speaking about. Further, let's see if I find my... There are the cognitive and affective processes. And these were taken from a National Research Council book um, called Adding It Up. But that include, you know, how, how to get the math to the place that um, it can be applied in all of those different settings. So you need the conceptual understanding of the math, the mathematics. So it's got to be integrated, it's got to be functional. These are the mathematical ideas. And then there's the reasoning. And this is the relationships across ideas or within, between ideas and, um, and situations. The strategic competence is having the ability to solve, to formulate problems and solve them. Figure out what the issue is, what the problem is, what am I going to do about it? How am I going to go about doing it? Having the strategies to do that and the strategic thinking. And then, of course, there's the procedural fluency. And most of the time when we think about math, we think about the procedures, like doing the math, even though there isn't always a lot of that in, in many contexts. Um, but that's the calculation. It can be estimation. It can be mental math. It doesn't have to be the procedure that you learned in school. And then, in some ways, extremely important, and maybe most important, is the productive disposition, the willingness to engage, to use the math to persevere in solving a problem as opposed to, I can't do this, I'll just not deal with it. So looking at the workplace context, in, um, in the research there have been a lot of studies, and some of you may have come across these, um, of how math is used in, in these different workplaces, and I'm not going to go through, and the only reason there's this many up there and not more is the slide was filled. Um, but they're really interesting how people use math in these different contexts, in work contexts, how in um, incumbent employees, people who are actually working, and for you, which I'm not going to talk about because I'm not supposed to talk about medicine so much, is there's very interesting studies done in England with nurses, and that's the noise, coils, hazi. Um, and uh, other studies about how nurses take the math, mathematical things that they have to do and how they do them and, and conceptualize. Um, but also, you know, everyday things, supermarket employees, plumbers, carpet layers. Um, and across all of these, it becomes apparent that 
the numeracy is deeply embedded in the context. What you do and how you do it depends on where you're doing it and what your purpose is. And people do things differently in different contexts for different purposes. Um, often, the, the numeracy is invisible. Um, people, you ask people in their jobs if they use math in their jobs, you know, going into a factory or anywhere, and they say no. And you follow them around, and they do all kinds of math. And you ask them about that, and they say, oh, that's just common sense. You know, that in that context, it's no longer math. Math is what you do in school. And there's right answers and wrong answers, and usually there's right ways to do it and wrong ways to do it. And, um, and the teacher's way is generally the right way, even if you do it differently. Um, and so there's a lot of that, but in the workplace where people do what they do, they do what makes sense to them in ways that make sense to them. Sometimes the math is hidden by technology. There's study of um, bank employees who are talking to people about um, interest rates and all kinds of security stuff, and they don't really understand how it works, how the math works, because they never see it. You know, you punch in the thing, you get the numbers, but you don't see how it works. And, and when they've asked people who work in those environments, they don't know. You know, they don't understand the compound interest stuff. They don't, you know, because all you do is punch it in, you get the numbers. It's sort of, in a, in a way, it's sort of like the McDonald's person who's giving you back your change, and they can't count it back. They have to put it in. So, you know, if you give them the extra two pennies, it kind of screws everything up, because the machine says this is how much change you're supposed to have. And so it's sort of like that. Um, and some procedures end up becoming devoid of mathematical um, meaning. Like in, um, I was at a construction site and they, and they were re in Trenton, they were rehabbing an old brownstone. And they had some problems when they were putting in the beams and, and it didn't come out the way they expected. You know, they ended up with more space on one side and they were trying to figure out if they made a mistake. And so they measured the diagonals to see if they were equal. And I asked, why were you doing that? And they had no clue. They said, if you want to find out if, you know, if everything is lined up, you make sure the diagonals are equal. And I don't think they use diagonals as a word, you know. But, you know, it's just a procedure that has a mathematical basis. But when people are using it in that context, they never learned the mathematics, they just know the procedure. And there are a lot of other situations like that. And probably there are things that we do similarly. Um, and then there's the community-based numeracy um, involving interpreting information. And so I hope I'm not treading. Um, but this was an article, we did some research with um, adult learners and what they were understanding about percent. And so there was an article in the USA Today a number of years ago, and it had a line that just said, detects cancer accurately in 90% of cases. So we just wanted to know if people were understanding percent. This was one of um, a number of um, things people looked at. And so the first um, so Steve says, yeah, it's a good test. 90% is almost all cases, close to 100%. That's how he explained making sense of it. And Laura said, I wouldn't depend on it. 90% is not good enough. What would perfect 100%? Okay, those are reasonable responses. You know, they're understanding what they're reading. But then, I'm obviously not, oh, there it is. Um, to somebody else, would you always use 100%? You said something about 100% to evaluate that Excuse kind me. of test. And Teresa said... Could, uh, could oh. you use the microphone? That because it won't record. Okay. If we're not using the microphone. Thanks. Um, okay, so Teresa says, in a way you don't know, it all depends on how many cases they use. 90% is good out of 100% of the people. So you think, okay, this is good. Then she says, if you have 250, 90% is not good. It's not half of 250 people. 125 would be half. So totally miss the proportional nature of percent. You know, but at first glance, it sounds like, you know, she's understanding what this means. And, you know, this is something that 
we can't assume that people understand unless we ask them. Um, whoops. And I missed one, but that's okay. Um, and then, you know, I, I live outside Philadelphia, and right now the Philadelphia public schools are broke. Um, my son was actually just laid off. Um, so they're saying, due to the budget situations, teachers, oh, okay, thanks. Teachers are being asked to take a 13% decrease in salary. This was what they offered the union at one point. And, you know, with the idea that after the fiscal crisis, like a number of years later, um, they'll get a 13% increase. Does this come out the same? And of course, if you sit and figure it out, you know, the first thought is, well, yeah, you know, but then you figure it out and it's not because percent is based on, you know, a different base. But, um, but here's an example that is real easy for people to automatically say, yeah, that's right. And then you can also ask somebody, which also is counterintuitive to many people, is, well, how about if I give you a 13% raise now, and then you take a 13% cut, are you going to be ahead? That's another one for you to figure out. See, I told you, I'm a math teacher. OK, so then there's family or personal numeracy, which includes things like these that are part of every day's um, everyday activities, including health-related decisions. And so here's an example from the literature. Um, somebody was doing some dieting, thanks, and, um, and had to figure out for a recipe three quarters of two-thirds of a cup of cottage cheese. So the dieter was allowed to have two-thirds of a cup of cottage cheese and was going to use three-quarters of it in a recipe. And so, you know, this, you can do this by the school method, but what the person did was measured out to two-thirds of a cup, made a little mound with a knife, made a cross, cut it this way, this way, put one quarter back in the container, and had the right amount, which makes so much sense. You know, I mean, probably most people would do something like that, you know, because it makes sense. And when you think about multiplying fractions, people don't exactly know what that means, how that works, what it really does. They know the procedure, and for dividing fractions, you know, it's like don't ask, invert, and multiply, or something like that. Ours is not to reason why, just invert and multiply, that's it. Um, <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, how people do things in real life may not be how they learned in school, but it's not lesser, you know, necessarily, it may be. Um, here's another one, shopping decisions. You get those Bed Bath & Beyond coupons all the time, and so it's $5 off a purchase of $15 or 20% off of one single item. You get both of those. Which one am I going to use? Well, it depends on how much money you're going to spend and if it's one item or a number of little items or something like that. You know, this is an everyday decision that anybody who goes to Bed Bath & Beyond makes. So trying to understand what Americans know about numeracy. So there have been a couple of um, international assessments, and we get the American piece of that data. And as I said, there was the International Adult Literacy Survey, even though it includes numeracy. Um, and in, in this one, they called it actually quantitative literacy. And the definition that they use in their materials is the knowledge and skills required to apply arith arithmetic operations, either alone or sequentially, to numbers embedded in printed material. Now, we all know that not all numbers come in printed material. You know, you're trying to figure out when you should get gas, and the little gauge on your car is between the first line and the second line, um, you're making some decisions. Something happened to the mic. Okay, and so um, we have seen in the last two versions of this assessment, and 
the states in 1992 and 2003. If you look down at the bottom, the quantitative literacy, um, it, in scoring in the lowest two levels, which is the same thing in the slide, but it's hard to see. Prose literacy, 43% of Americans scored in the bottom two levels, basic and below basic. Document literacy, 34%. Quantitative literacy, 55%. And so there's another assessment that's the International Life Skills Survey. And this um, is kind of a richer idea of numeracy because it's about people managing a, a situation, solving a problem in a real context, involves responding to information about mathematical ideas, and the information may not be in text. It may be a picture of your gas gauge. Um, that may be represented in a number of ways. Requires activation of a range of enabling knowledge, behaviors, and processes. And so that assessment was used in an adult education program study. So now these are terrible scores because these are adult education students. These are people who are going back to school to complete their high school equivalency, like a GED or something. But even in that context, math is weakest. And just so you, about the larger, this is the GED passing rates from 2012 for all the people who took the GEDs. So 90% passed this test, there are five tests on the GED. You come to math, 80%. So knowing that people are across the board weakest in math. And then for a community college, developmental math, who passes all of the developmental math, the remedial math courses they're assigned. So they pass math at very low levels. So Americans are pretty weak in math. And so, in summary, numeracy situations may require counting, quantifying, computing, all of these, and have a clear right or wrong answer. They also can make, involve making sense of verbal, pictorial, text-based messages based on quantitative data, but not having to manipulate numbers, just interpreting them. And then finding and considering multiple pieces of information to determine a course of action, often without clear, correct answers. I mean, these are the kinds of numeracy situations. But, and then still, always, numeracy is, is not to pass a test. I mean, that's a purpose, I guess. But it, it's really to solve a problem, make a decision, and always with a purpose and within a context. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ginsburg.